Welcome to another episode of the School of Elijah podcast. You know, I am so filled with the joy of the Lord to be able to minister in this way. It's not um, not really my preferred way of talking to people. I'd much rather be face to face, but this is where we are at the moment and um, I'm excited about what God is doing with his church and his people you know we are living in the end times and a lot of what we see going on in the world is God's plan we don't need to be despairing You know, he's already revealed it to us in his word. There will be a rise of an antichrist. So it's no surprise that the world is being controlled by an antichrist spirit right now as we speak. And now is the time for the church to arise. There will be an end time revival. I believe there'll be an end time revival like the world has never seen. Every other revival in the world is going to be a that's that's taken place. The Welsh revival, you know, the Azusa Street revival, um, you know, these are only small little fires compared to the end time revival um, that's going to take place, and um, it'll be known as the revival. Um, Yeah, literally, everything in the world is known up until now has been like campfires. And this end time revival is going to be like a forest fire. It's going to be like a a bushfire. It's going to take the world by surprise and the church by surprise Um, but there are some of us who are ready and um, I just want to share now from the Word of God it's a study that I I, uh, want to do on the life of Elijah and um, Yeah, just before before I get in the Word of God, I am I I just am so excited about our destiny in the New Jerusalem. It's it's coming to pass, and it's not going to be long. Um, so I encourage every Christian out there to walk in truth, to obey the commands of God, to um, bear much fruit. Abide in Jesus, because if we abide in Jesus, if we live in Jesus, we will bear much fruit. And fruitfulness is what he's looking for. Um, This is not a surprise. You look at everything he taught. He's looking for people who bear much fruit. And um, the times are running low for us to be fruitful. Um, You know, Let's not be like the people in the times of Jesus where he'd look at the religious people and he'd say, you know, prostitutes and tax collectors are going to get in the kingdom of God before you do. You know, um, you know, I, I wouldn't like to be uh, thinking that I would be one of those religious people that Jesus is saying you're... <laughs> You've got this group of people that you look down upon, that that you you call sinners. They're gonna they're gonna make it in the kingdom of God before you do, and um, you know I just want to be one of the people that Jesus can rely upon, because I walk with Him and I talk with Him, and I just want to be with Him. Um, 
where he shows me to go, I'll go. And what he says for me to do, I'll do. And right now he's, he's asked me to um, share this word. So I hope this can be of encouragement. I'm going to read from 1 Kings um, and it's chapter 17. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe, um, there's a little A there, which down the bottom it says, or Tishbite, of the settlers. So Elijah the Tishbite from, of the settlers in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. We'll just stop there for a second and look at that. So, you know, we've got Elijah, the Tishbite. Who are the Tishbites? They're not really um, talked about in the Bible. Um, he's not of the tribe of Reuben or Simon. Is it Simon or Simeon? Um, he's not. You know, we can we can look for the the Tishbites, and there's not much there, if anything. Um, Gilead is an area of land that was taken when Joshua and the Israelites came into that area Gilead was one of the regions that they took over so he's living he's living in the promised land but he's really a nobody he's you know who who is he he's he's not from the tribe of Judah where Jesus descended from he's you know not from Levi he's not a part of the the, the priesthood but he comes on the scene and um, comes out of nowhere, goes to the king. Now, the king has been setting up altars for Baal, building a temple of Baal. Um, and he's come up to him and says, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, and he gives that prophecy about a drought. There'll be no more rain. There won't even be dew until I say so. Wow, that's that's a bot. But that that's it. Then he goes. Um, we'll we'll get into that in a minute. But I just want to talk about the fact that sometimes God calls people, and they seem to come out of nowhere. And it's not always the people who have the spotlight on them for years and years and years, but sometimes out of the um, out of the promised land come prophets and men of God to speak God's word. And, um, you know, I, I was reading the other day, um, you know, this prophetic word of the 90s, uh, Rick Joyner, who many regard as ha having prophetic insight in the, um, in the body of Christ. And, you know, I found it interesting. It says, many of the most powerful apostles and prophets will remain nameless and faceless to the public. So he's talking about the the um, the end time ministries and uh, you know these have no desire to build major ministries and will not covet fame and fortune um, and uh, you know I could uh, go on there but I don't want to just be reading out of a book uh, for the podcast but um, says these will not even rank 
seek rank or position in the church at this time, but will quietly, sometimes incognito, direct the end time strategy of the church. And, um, you know, that's a little bit like Elijah. He was coming out of nowhere. He was a nobody. And, um, and that's, and that's what God has really put on my heart for this, um, podcast, this, uh, school of Elijah is that it will be people who are incognito, people that the body of Christ doesn't know or doesn't recognize, but God's been preparing for years, um, to rise up as a prophetic voice to give guidance to the church in the last days. Um, and, you know, I've uh, shared previously that, you know, it'll be a really powerful thing to to have, um, you know, just imagine a hundred people all have the same similar dream or all speak a prophetic word um, independent of each other. And... You know, we can gather those words through the marvel of modern technology, emails and the like, and say, hey, we've all got this word and uh, be able to announce it to the body of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. And, um, you know, when it's coming from hundreds or thousands of prophetic people, even though they might not have the names that, um, you know, the famous prophets um, it'll carry weight because it's independently been um, given by by God, by the Holy Spirit. And so um, Elijah, um, he came out of Gilead and, um, you know, somewhere that's it's not really expounded on much in, in the, um, the Word of God. Um, at least I can't remember it being. Uh, someone will probably point out, oh, yeah, the, 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 <laughs> there's all these uh, references, um, but um, I can't remember it being a, a place of significance. And so, um, excuse me. So how did Elijah know that he was a prophet? You know, he must have, um, you know, spent years praying and, and hearing God's voice in his head. And, um, you know, who knows, maybe he had angelic visitations. We don't know that because his background, his training, so to speak, is somewhat of a mystery. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want these podcasts to be about me like i like i want to point people to the truth in god's word you know i'd much prefer just to teach the word of god and and not talk about me at all but um you know i feel that god just wants me to share some of my journey and um there's going to be people out there that you you're questioning you know do i have a prophetic call do i um have the gift of a prophet, am I a prophet? Um, I, you know, you, you're not sure. Um, and maybe if I share some of my journey, my insight, um, it will be of encouragement to others. Um, yeah, sorry if there's sounds of traffic and stuff. Um, I don't have a fancy studio, but um, I do have this fancy light. So thank God that I got a free stand the other day, a mobile stand, so I can look slightly professional. Um, so, yeah, I shared previously in a previous podcast about a dream that I had while I was working on fishing trawlers that was something that you, you couldn't put down to coincidence because it was... Um, you know, such an unusual event where, you know, the boat was almost capsizing. And, you know, in all my time on fishing, there's only one time that the boat nearly capsized. You know, thankfully, um, it's not a common event. But, you know, hour, just hours before it 
almost capsized. I was asleep and had a very vivid, very, um, you know, realistic dream of exactly what was to happen. And, you know, I, I woke up and I shared that dream. And when it came to pass, it was quite um, amazing. And, you know, that is beyond coincidence. You know, that, that, that's, that's um, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but now when I can look back, I can go, yeah, there's a seed of a prophetic gift there. I used to, um, when I wasn't fishing, I would be trekking around the jungles of Indonesia, camping on the beach and, you know, surfing some of the um, best waves in the world. And um, sometimes during these experiences, I would realize that there was a calling on my life and I'd just be like dumbfounded as to how it's, you know, how could it, I wasn't walking with the Lord. I, I was not in the word, I I would not even, I would, if someone asked me, what do you believe? I would sort of say, ah, don't believe in God. That's where I was um, in those fishing and surfing years because my heart was set on one thing, finding the most perfect waves in the world and surfing as many of them as I can. And um, there was one event that was quite significant that I, th I feel I can share. Um, and that was at a, um, I met this guy in Bali and uh, he said to me, do you want to come to Jakarta with me? I've got tickets to a Sepultura concert. I'm like, mm, who's Sepultura? He goes, oh, they're a bit like Metallica. You know, they're, they're really popular, you know, heavy metal, thrash band, you know, and um, he goes, oh, it'll be fun. Do you want to come along? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, so we ended up going to this, um, yeah, at this concert. It was um, quite a scary situation because we, at the time, I had long, long longish blonde hair. Um, and, you know, so did my friend who invited me and we stuck out like anything. We're, we're a little bit taller than the average Indonesian. Um, and so our heads are sort of sticking out in the crowd as different. And we were up close near the front of the, um, stage and, you know, you know, these heavy metal have like a, a mosh pit where you know people are thrashing around and and uh, you know we, I realized that we were the target of violence like guys were like running towards us like with elbows and knees and like they were pushing us on the ground and I realized hey this is not fun <laughs> this is <laughs> and um, you know I stood up and and I'm looking around and there's all these like gangster looking guys. And, you know, one of them had this bandana on his head and, you know, all these earrings. And, and um, he, he looks, comes right up to me and pushes me. And he says, this is our city. Tonight you die. And uh, then I look over and my friend's on the ground with guys jumping on him. And like, I'm just like... From, from that moment, it was like things started going in slow motion. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> we could die tonight. Like, this is pretty serious. All these guys surrounding us, and I'm, and I'm just looking and I'm surveying. It was at a soccer stadium, right? And there was just this sea of Asians, like black hair. And as far as you could see on the on the football field there was people and in the stadiums there was people and it felt like everyone was looking at me 
and everyone hated me. You know, we were different. Um, we, uh, we were the white guys at the opposite end of racism. Like, you know, we, there was racism towards us. And um, simply because we were different, we stuck out. And um, yeah, I um, as, as it's going in, in slow motion, I was like, you know, I prayed. I cried out to God. I said, God, I know you have a plan for my life. Please save me from this situation because if you don't save me, how will this plan unfold? And I heard the voice of God, you know, it's, it's loud, it's noisy, it's just this, you know, heavy metal music. But in amongst all that noise, I heard the voice of God say, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for I am with you. And all the fear evaporated. It was like, that was God. He said, don't fear. And, you know, and I, and I, I go over to um, where my friend is on the ground and I hoist him up and I say, follow me. And all these guys are like surrounding us. And I just look through the crowd and it's like a tunnel vision was going to, um, there was a girl in the crowd. I think she was the only, well, there was actually two girls, her and a friend, and, but I could only see one at the time. And I'm like, um, you know, I just knew if I go there, I'll be safe. And so we were running and dodging people and, and these guys are following us. I look over my shoulder and all these guys are like trying to chase us down. And we, we, we got up to this girl and I said in my best Indonesian, um, can we stand with you? Can you help us? These guys want to kill us. And she said with an Australian accent, I don't know what you guys are doing here. It's a dangerous place. But yeah, sure, stand with us. Here are my friends. And we went round and shook hands with about 20 guys. And some of them are, you know, quite big guys. And, you know, and, they're, and so we stood in the middle. They had a ring around us of... Um, um, a ring of protection. I felt like I was surrounded by angels. And then, you know, I realized I am like, you know, yeah, these guys were actual guys, but beyond them, I'm sure there was also a ring of angels because um, people were praying for me, even though I didn't realize it um, at the time. And, um, and, you know, God has a plan for my life. And um, he found a way for us to get out without... There were, there were four other white guys that we saw in the crowd um, that night. They all ended up in hospital in comas. Their faces were unrecognisable. Um, that could have been me, but a turn of events, you know, coming into this circle of safety. And outside, I could see that there was guys just waiting for a chance to, um, to get us. And, you know, the place was crazy. Outside was a riot zone. People who didn't have tickets to this concert were looting. You know, there, there was glass everywhere. There were shops on fire. There was, it was just a mayhem outside. Um, and, you know, we, we, long story short, we got out of there unscathed. And that proved to me that God was real and that my life Ultimately, I would surrender to him. Um, my life is not my own. He, it was more than coincidence we got. It wasn't because I was a, a good, slick, street smart guy that could work his way out of a, um, you know, a riotous situation where people actively wanted to harm me. Um, it was God's deliverance. 
God is real. And so I went back to um, Bali and was surfing at Uluwatu. And um, I remember one day I had this cap, you know, this billabong cap that I loved. I thought it was, you know, it was, it just felt like it was, it was me. Like, you know, everywhere I went, I had this cap. And um, oh, I just, um, I remember surfing and I left my cap in the, I, I had all my, my things, my backpack, my um, extra surfboards, they were all in the um, warung where you where you cook up uh, where you, where someone cooks up street food and um, we had this deal if we eat there we can sleep there and there was you know bamboo beds no mattresses but um, you know we were happy a roof over our head we'd eat there during the day and then surf all day and I was surfing and this knowledge came into my mind that my cap was gone. I realized I'd never see it again. Right then and there while I was surfing, I was like, oh no, I'm never gonna see my cap again. And <laughs> so I, I continued surfing and I, and I came in and sure enough, my cap was gone. I'm like, where's my cap? Who stole my cap? Um, it just disappeared, walked away. Um, but once again, there's that inkling. There's a some type of a seed of prophetic here. Uh, I don't know it at the time. It just seems like weird or coincidence, or you know, you you, you try and rationalise these things sometimes. Um, it's not until later you look back. But um, it's because at that time, the prophetic anointing was coming down on my life. I think it was either that night or you know, very close to that time with, the, you know, that incident with the cap, that I had a vision of revival in Indonesia where it was, hard, it's hard to explain, but it was, um, it wasn't anything that I was thinking, but all of a sudden I'm thinking it. I'm like, why am I thinking this? And then I kept on seeing, you know, what was happening as um, people were turning their lives to Jesus and churches were being planted and churches were growing. And it seemed to happen really quickly that Indonesia became a Christian nation. It's currently at the time and, and probably still is the world's largest Muslim nation. And um, I saw it become a Christian nation and that vision um I believe will come to pass one day, um, part of the end time revival. But at the time, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't sleep the whole night. And the whole night, the whole vision I thought went for an hour, but it was actually a lot longer um, because it was like, you know, 10 o'clock at night and next second the sun's coming up and I haven't slept. Um, and I've just been seeing this reality, what seemed real in my mind of stuff that I could not comprehend, but Indonesia became a Christian nation. And so um, even then I still don't understand what's going on. Um, it's not un until years later that you realize um, through things people say and you realize that's just not typical um you know it's not typical people have all night visions um but um you know i share that so we can have some understanding about elijah you know i'm sure elijah had events in his life that he realized at some point I'm called to be a prophet of God. Um, he said, it says as the, um, 
as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Somehow he knew that he was, you know, I'm sure God told him, you say the word <laughs> and that'll be it. You know, can you imagine though, the, the temptation to doubt, like, you know, he's going to go up there in front of the king and say this, what if it doesn't happen? What if it rains the next day? I'll look like a fool. Um, but he had confidence. He was that sure of his calling as a prophet that he went to the king and said these words. What did he do after that? Let's go on in verse 2. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You'll drink from the brook, and I have instructed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went down, he went to the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So, some of us, you know, our big moment in ministry where God's given us a mission, God's given us a calling, God's given us a word. And we need to understand that that might be it. We give the word and then might God say, time to hide. But we want to stay around. We want... We enjoyed that. Everyone was like, oh, I gave the word of the Lord. He gave the word of the Lord. Let's hang, you know, feel like hanging around and, and uh, you know, and continuing giving the word of the Lord. That's my job now, to give the word of the Lord. And so, you know, what happens is you start walking out of the call of God. And who knows what prophecies you start giving because you're the prophet. You need to keep prophesying. Um, when in fact it's maybe just one word that God's given you. And in this case, it was a word that was also going to be a sign and a wonder. It was a word of, he, he didn't come and say, repent. No, he didn't come to Ahab and say, God has said you need to repent or there will be no more rain. He's just gone and said, There'll be no more rain until I say so. See ya. And then there's no more rain. You know, this is a word that's to become a sign and a wonder. Um, so many of us would be tempted after we give a word like that to go, I'm going to hang around. Obviously, God's going to say, repent, you're worshipping Baal. So you hang around and you just do what's obvious. Yep, you need to repent. You need to repent. Um but no, you've got to listen to the word of God in your spiritual ears and go, well, God's actually told me to leave. I better obey. In the natural, you might think this makes, this makes no sense. I'm called to be a prophet of God and God wants me to hide. Is that what he wants his prophets to do? Hide? That may be what God wants you to do. Um, why? This is a time where God provided bread and meat supernaturally. Ravens. I mean, if a raven came and dropped half a loaf of bread in your lap, you might think that was a fluke, okay? But then dropped a, a you know a, a small rabbit or a rodent or something like that in that you can cook up and eat in your lap, you might think, wow, God has blessed me. But if it happened every single day, that's supernatural. That's not a fluke. And um, so God was supernatural. So that is symbolic. You know, if we look at another meaning, how can we apply that to our life, right? Bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Bread is symbolic of the word of God. Jesus said, Remember, 
um, when he was being tempted, he said, uh, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So bread has a relationship spiritually with the word of God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And Jesus is the word of God. So when we see Elijah spending time in retreat, spending time being supernaturally fed by bread, the meat, the meat. Remember, the author of Hebrews says, you know, he wishes that he could feed spiritual meat, but um, you still need to drink milk. Um, so, oh no, it says solid food. Solid food. Um, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature. So um, God doesn't want us to live on spiritual milk. Peter wrote about um, spiritual milk as well. Uh, maybe he's the one who wrote about meat. No, um, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so you may grow up in your salvation so um now i've got a feeling a previous translation of hebrews says meat rather than solid food but anyway um this meat represents just solid revelation you know this this is understanding of god's word this is not just elementary teachings this it's more than just elementary teachings so um, bread, meat, and he drank from the brook, living water, okay? I'm not saying that was living water. I'm saying that represents living water to us. There's the three things that God sometimes will ask you to retreat and simply just feed on his word, receive the meat of the word, Chew on the meat of the word, digest the meat of the word and drink from the living water, the fountain of living water that flows from the throne of God. We've got access to that living water. You know, often as I pray and I come before the throne of God, I'm like, God, while I'm here, I'm just going to have a drink of that living water and, um, you know, and allow that living water into my spirit to bring life to my body, to bring life to my spirit, to cleanse the um you know the dirt from the from the world that that clings um and to wash um away all the um the dust of the world so living water is awesome living water is good um these are the things that god wants us to feed on while there's a time of waiting We've got to understand there's the timing of God. And, you know, as God might call us to do something, don't just assume you keep on doing it. You've got to listen. Ah, okay, I do that, but now God wants me to do this, which is just grow, just retreat. You know, sometimes we can get so busy for the word of, for the kingdom of God. Yes, the heart is good. The heart is zealous. The, it's a noble idea to be working hard in the kingdom of God. But if we're working hard at the expense of not eating properly and not drinking the right food, if we're on the wrong diet, we'll wither away. We're working hard, but we're not getting the right spiritual nutrition to sustain us will end up burning out. How do I know this? <laughs> Experience, you know? So this is a, this is a real thing. We, we need to be mindful of what God wants us to be doing. And don't just assume that, oh, the, the Bible says go into all the world. I'm just gonna go into all the world. But maybe he just wants you to be eating and drinking the right 
spiritual food. Um, so I, I actually wanted to do talk about this whole chapter, but um, I think it's probably better just to have bite-size um, episodes. Um, I'm not sure how long this has been going, but uh, I just feel um, we might just leave it there and think about those things. Um, let's pray and um, just pray that God would um, make this word come alive in our hearts. Father, we thank you for the, the life of Elijah. Thank you for this opportunity you've given me, Lord, through the wonders of technology to share this word to whoever wants to listen. And I pray that people listening, Lord, would uh, be encouraged to look into their life. And maybe it's not a prophetic calling. Maybe it's they realize their calling is, is elsewhere, but they um, will be encouraged to continue to prepare, to listen, um, and to um, follow your calling in their life, Lord. I pray that the prophetic voice would rise up, Lord, and there will be people that would um, respond to the calling of their life, Lord, that they would not listen to the ears of, uh, that they, their ears would not be open to the, to the um, lies of the enemy or the distractions of other people who would say um, and laugh at them to think, you're not a prophet or you, <laughs> your prophecies, uh, we've had enough of them. But um, they would realize that God, he knows who he's called and um, he's raising up a school of prophets for these end times. And I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. You are in control. You are the God, the awesome God that we serve and we love you so much, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for our destiny in the new Jerusalem with the Lamb of God. And uh, we just praise you, Lord. Look forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb. In Jesus' name, amen.